Hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us for Seize the Moment, Adapting Old Tools for a Novel Coronavirus. My name is Gabriela Gerhardt. I work for the Mortgage Institute for Research, and I will be moderating the session today. The Mortgage Institute for Research is an independent biomedical research institute in Madison, Wisconsin. We work in partnership with the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm joined by five Mortgage Institute scientists, John Brubaker, go ahead and give a wave, uh, Tony Gitter, Brian Bockelman, hey. Ben Cox, and Katie Overmeyer. None of these scientists are virologists, and most have never applied their expertise to study viruses before. But as the pandemic unfolded, working with their teams, these scientists identified opportunities to contribute to the scientific knowledge around COVID-19 and the virus that causes it, SARS-CoV-2. You'll hear about the incredible teamwork and collaborations that made this possible. Our format today will be five mini lectures, one by each scientist here. Afterward, we will all come together for a question and answer session. We plan to wrap up by 5 p.m. Please take a look at the chat section on the right side of your screen. Feel free to ask questions about the lectures as you watch them by writing them in the chat and marking them as a question. We will choose some of these questions to answer during the Q&A. Please note that most of these lectures have been pre-recorded and the scientists may chime in during the chat in the chat during the lectures with links and additional information. First up is Dr. John Brubaker. He is a visiting assistant scientist working in Dr. Phil Newmark's lab, studying planarian flatworms. He will tell you about a project designed to generate antibodies for flatworm research and how it was repositioned to focus on SARS-CoV-2. Good afternoon. My name is John Brubaker and I'm a visiting scientist in Phil Newmark's lab at the Moorbridge Institute. This afternoon, I wanna tell you about a current project in the lab to generate antibodies as tools to study and possibly treat the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Let's start with a quick look at antibodies and how they can be useful. Antibodies are proteins that bind to a precise location on a specific target molecule. And what makes this binding interaction so specific is the shape of the antibody's binding site, which snugly fits the corresponding site on the target. Now, the ability to stick to a particular spot and a particular molecule may seem like a lame superpower, but antibodies play a critical role in our immune system's ability to neutralize infectious agents. And they've also become essential tools for researchers studying biological processes at the molecular level. We can take the novel coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, as an example of antibodies utility. The surface of the virus is covered in spike proteins, and these spikes interact with a receptor molecule found on certain cells in our bodies. This interaction allows the virus to enter into the cell and use it as a host, producing more viruses, which amplifies the infection. Now, antibodies that can bind to these spike proteins could be used for many purposes. Here's just a few. First, we can label antibodies with other molecules, such as fluorescent tags that emit light. When these labeled antibodies bind, their targets become visible with a microscope. This allows us to detect the molecule in a tissue sample and also see exactly where it is, which is essential for answering questions about the process of infection. Second, we can use antibodies to capture and purify those target molecules, like the spike protein. With a pure sample of that molecule, we can study its characteristics and see how it behaves in different circumstances. And third, antibodies can be used to alter or inactivate the molecules they bind to. Because spike proteins are key to the virus entering the host cell, covering them up with specific antibodies could substantially slow the virus's replication. And so antibodies like this could potentially be used as novel medications. So enter the Newmark lab team. In Phil Newmark's lab, we focus mainly on studying regeneration and parasitic diseases using flatworms as our study subjects. But when COVID-19 emerged this year, we started to talk about how the lab could contribute in a meaningful way to confronting the pandemic. Tracy Chong and I had already started a project to isolate antibodies that would be useful tools for our flatworm research. And although worms and viruses are quite different, the process of generating antibodies is basically the same, regardless of what you're targeting. So Phil encouraged us to shift the focus of the project from worms to coronavirus 
and he let us use significant lab resources for that purpose. Melanie Isigonis and Tanya Rosario, our lab's senior scientists, were also indispensable in working out the general flow of the project with me. Now, because of necessary regulations to limit the number of people in the lab, only one of Tracy or myself could do the actual lab work, and I happen to be the one who lives closer. To help me keep things moving as needed, Kaylee Browder, our essential lab specialist, has been working with me from at least six feet away since April. So although I happen to be the person speaking for the project, this is really a group effort and one that's been made possible by the ways that Morebridge actively encourages and supports scientists to be flexible and adaptable in service to society. Now, the antibodies that we're looking to produce more precisely are known as nanobodies. They're single binding regions of antibodies from llamas or their relatives. And you can ask me about why llamas later if you're interested. You can think of a nanobody as an antibody pared down to its smallest functional unit. Several labs are making encouraging progress on COVID nanobody projects, which is excellent. But that said, there's a strong component of luck regarding whether or not a particular nanobody will work for a particular application. And so it's productive for several labs worldwide to pursue similar projects. The more coronavirus binding nanobodies we develop, the wider the range of tools we'll have for research, diagnostics, and therapy. Now, the standard way to obtain antibodies or nanobodies is to vaccinate an animal with the target molecule, but those results can be unpredictable. So instead, we're using a remarkable resource, a yeast nanobody library that was developed by Connor McMahon in Andrew Cruz's lab at Harvard University. They've made the library openly available to nonprofit researchers. So to produce the library, they began with the llama gene that encodes antibodies and produced a large collection of variants of the gene that are identical to each other, except for three variable regions where they randomize the sequence of the gene, and that determines the shape and specificity of each nanobody's binding domain. They then introduced these randomized nanobody genes into yeast cells so that each yeast cell will produce a unique nanobody variant and display copies of that nanobody on its surface. In the end, they produced a library of about 500 million unique nanobody displaying yeast cells. That's a large enough set that whichever molecule you want to target, there should be at least one nanobody variant in the library that binds to it. And we can use any suitable variants that we find in the library to start cultures that will then be reliable sources of nanobodies. It's not as fun as hanging out with llamas, but it's a lot faster. So how do we find those promising variants? we're focusing on or targeting the spike protein of the virus. So we start with spike protein fragments and use those fragments to coat the surface of tiny microscopic magnetic beads. Then we can mix those magnetic beads with, the, with cells from the yeast library and any cells displaying nanobodies that bind to the spike fragment will therefore also bind to and be coated by these tiny magnetic beads. So then we can isolate uh, yeast cells of interest just by using a magnet to pull those cells out of the culture. We can grow up cultures from individual cells and characterize the nanobodies they produce. And this is the phase that we're getting into now. Once we've identified a few promising candidates, we'll partner with other labs to help us evaluate and develop the nanobodies as research tools, as diagnostic aids, or if we're really lucky, as antiviral therapies. So thanks so much for coming out to listen this afternoon, and I'll look forward to taking your questions later. Thank you so much, John. That was fantastic. Looking forward to finding out about why llamas later. Next up is Dr. Anthony Gitter, who some of you may recognize from our last webinar. Tony is a primary investigator at Morgridge who specializes in bioinformatics. His lab is part of the John W. and Jean M. Rowe Center for Research in Virology. He will share how the Manubot software he co-developed is coordinating dozens of scientists internationally to rapidly assess and review COVID-19 diagnostics and therapeutics. Hello everyone. I'm going to tell you today about how the Manubot software I co-developed is being used to chronicle pandemic science in real time. So as we're hearing in this webinar today, scientists all over the world have been thinking to themselves, how can I best use my scientific expertise and the tools I have at hand to help fight this COVID-19 pandemic. And one of the consequences of that 
as many different scientific labs have turned their attention to COVID-19, has been a flood of new literature about the pandemic and about the virus. So in just the uh, past months of 2020, this Nature News article estimated that nearly 30,000 scientific articles have been written specifically about COVID-19. So clearly far too many for any individual scientist to keep up with. One solution has been yet another type of scientific article known as a review. So the example on the left shows where a team of PhDs and MDs have worked together to review as of July 10th, some of the latest scientific news about COVID-19 transmission, treatment, and other topics. I read this, it's in a very well-respected medical journal, and it's an excellent overview of COVID-19. But the problem was, it was written on July 10th, and even later that week, some very important news broke about COVID-19 vaccines, and specifically phase one results from Moderna's clinical trials about their vaccine. So this is a real challenge when we have a very, very fast moving scientific area like COVID-19, where new literature is appearing daily, is that any review becomes stale as soon as a scientist prints it out to read it. So one of the solutions to that uh, stale literature review is, is through a software tool called Manubot, which stands for Manuscript Robot. And Manubot's software that I've been working on with Daniel Himmelstein, who was a postdoc at Casey Green's lab at the University of Pennsylvania. And its main idea is to bring software development best practices and approaches to scientific writing. So in software development, it's common to use a platform like GitHub for developers, software engineers all over the world to team up to work on the same code base, editing it and automatically checking that the code doesn't break as they add new features. Manuscripts bringing that, or Manubot brings those ideas to scientific writing. And there's a lot of great features. I'd like to tell you about three of them today, learning about how it's open to everyone how Manubot manuscripts are living documents and how they are fully collaborative. So to talk about how it's open to everyone, I can share the origin story of the Manubot COVID-19 review manuscript on COVID-19 diagnostics and therapeutics. So it started at the University of Pennsylvania where my collaborator Casey and a postdoc in his lab, Haley Rando, realized that there was a lot of misinformation circulating about COVID-19 and that a collaborative manuscript could have combat that misinformation. So they established some of the infrastructure for this COVID-19 review, and I chipped in and helped at that stage. And Casey put out a broad call that any scientist who had expertise with COVID-19 could join this effort. And that call was well received, where fast forwarding to today, we now have over 30 authors from different continents and countries who have all helped out by contributing their expertise toward this big collaborative manuscript all about COVID-19. And one of the great things is that as we have so many authors all working on the same document, uh, the document itself is updated on a near daily basis. The manuscript is a website, so whenever somebody visits the manuscript website, they'll see the latest and greatest version, and we can see how the website and the manuscript has expanded over time from March, April, and all the way through July, where authors have joined the project and been writing a lot about COVID-19 vaccines and diagnostics, uh, clinical aspects, basic biology. But another way in which Manu Manubot manuscripts are living documents is that a lot of them are actually driven automatically by software in the back end. So Manubot manuscript like our COVID-19 review can pull data from external sources like the two I've shown here and automatically update numbers that appear in the manuscript and figures that appear in the manuscript. So on the left side, we see a Johns Hopkins project that's tracking COVID-19 global deaths over time, which we think is important to really stress how dire the situation is and how important it is to continue scientific research. And we see uh, that on the left side, initially when we added this figure, the global deaths had just crossed the 400,000 mark. But if we fast forward a month later, that figure has been updating itself automatically without anyone touching it day by day. And now here we are in the middle of July, global deaths approaching nearly 600,000. So we continue to be uh, in a high alert stance where, where more research into COVID-19 is needed. On the right side, similarly, we see figures that are being automatically generated, pulling information from the University of Oxford's clinical trials tracker. And we can use this to automatically write parts of the manuscript that say things like, well, here are all the trials about some specific drug or some specific vaccine. Here's what phase they are in, here's which trials are completed, and here are the publications describing those completed trials. And that's not just written once, it updates itself every single day as the clinical trials database is updated. Manubot documents and manuscripts are also fully collaborative. So to illustrate, here we have one of the authors, John, who wanted to write more about the clinical aspects of COVID-19 and added some new sentences to the manuscript, which are highlighted in green. 
After he added that text, two others joined in and started discussing those sentences. So that was Haley, the project lead, and a medical student who had a lot of expertise in this type of text and about the clinical symptoms. So they worked together for about a week to refine and improve and expand this text until the project lead approved those changes. The changes were merged into the main document and then all the new text and the new scientific studies that were being referenced uh, appeared in the manuscript website. So we see that example here where a few paragraphs were added, including new references like this example from the New England Journal of Medicine. So anybody in the world can propose new changes. It doesn't have to be somebody who was previously involved with the manuscript. It's open to all because we have discussion and review process for all the, the potential updates. So next we're looking to submit the COVID-19 review to a scientific journal. But what's really exciting is that our team is going to continue working on this review and the journal has agreed to accept more versions of the, of the Manubot scientific review on COVID-19 diagnostics as the review continues to evolve over the coming months. So thank you very much. And if you'd like to check out the work in progress, the URL is here. Though as we caution, this is not necessarily advice for the general public, but it's really a review of scientific literature. All right, thank you so much, Tony. Next up is Dr. Brian Bockelman, an investigator in Mortgage's core computation group. He focuses on enabling research computing across the Institute on the University of Mad Wisconsin-Madison campus and beyond. And he's also the technology area coordinator for the Open Science Grid, led by Dr. Marone Livney. Uh, you're up, Brian, take it away. Uh, so I wanna talk a little bit today about the research computing infrastructure we have at Mortgage uh, and how it impacts scientists here at the Institute, uh, scientists all around the UW campus and across the nation and how it's used to help uh, fight and understand the pandemic. So research computing infrastructure is a bit of a different beast. Uh, it is uh, utilizing uh, many computers put together to solve, help scientists solve a specific problem. And in particular here at Mortgage, we really want to emphasize to scientists that instead of thinking about the problems that they can solve with the resources that they know about, uh, but rather they should think about the problems that they can solve with unlimited computing and think big and tackle some of the big challenges. And then within the infrastructure, rather than focus on computers, we really focus on providing the people and the techniques to help them move quickly. So when I think of infrastructure, I like to say, I want to turn silicon bottlenecks into carbon ones. That is, I want people who are before waiting on silicon, that is the computers, uh, to instead uh, have the slowest part being the humans asking the questions. Humans coming up with the great ideas, humans looking at the data or the intermediate results. And I really want an infrastructure that somewhat gets out of the way and let the humans be the people who guide and ask questions. And normally when we talk about infrastructure at Mortgage, we like to emphasize that it's three things. It's the people and the experts that uh, know how to collaborate, know how to talk with domain scientists and how to pick apart problems and think about how they apply to computing. It's the software, the toolkits and frameworks that we use uh, to help drive the computers. And then yes, at some extent, uh, you need to finally have hardware, but we re really like to emphasize those three, people, software, computers, uh, because it's all too easy to think about them the other way around. And the other thing that's maybe a little different about the research computing infrastructure is that it's uh, flexible, can be moved quickly, and it can be global. So the infrastructure that was used last year uh, to help uh, study uh, particle collisions uh, for the particle accelerator at CERN they have a picture on the left, can this year be used to help fight the pandemic? And finally, I, I always like to point out to people, research computing is, is not exactly the same as using your iPhone or opening your laptop. And it really requires this human aspect, the close collaboration between the computer scientists and the domain scientists. So I wanna give three little anecdotes of places where we've made hopefully a difference within the pandemic. The first one I want to emphasize is work done at Mortgage, that particularly one of the new PIs here, uh, Tim Grant has been tasked with taking uh, cryo-EM pictures of human ribosomes that were mixed with uh, RNA 
uh, containing some of the coronavirus structures. And he wants to understand how the RNA is shaped and how it tricks the human ribosome and producing proteins with uh, the thoughts that if you can understand these structures, that you can hopefully disrupt them and prevent the virus from replicating. And this is really, for me, an interesting project in that he takes the pictures on the left, uh, applies uh, through some of the systems he's developed over 90,000 CPU hours, which would be a few years in your laptop, and starts looking at potential structures of how this might look like. Uh, it's a, a progress work in progress. Uh, he has eight different structures he's looking at uh, that I put there. And I, I really enjoy this one because it shows how much computing can accelerate, that he can do weeks, within weeks, using the infrastructure, what otherwise might take years. Another interesting one is the O'Connor Lab work at UW-Madison. And this, of course, is leveraging the Center for High Throughput Computing, or CHTC, at UW-Madison. And this one's slightly different in that uh, the O'Connor Lab is sequencing uh, the samples from actual patients in Wisconsin. And what they're looking for are mutations in the virus from these samples, and to try to understand how these uh, mutations propagate uh, through, throughout communities and through time and to, to understand how the pandemic evolves and how the, the virus mutates. And this is a really interesting case because it's not focusing on scale. It's not how many tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of hours we get to them, but to really turn around the sample and the sequencing in time for them to be useful to understand the propagation. And finally, infrastructure uh, is, of course, global. Uh, and in fact, we at UW-Madison help lead the Open Science Grid, a national distributed computing partnership that involves uh, hundreds of different uh, computing sites and universities and labs all across the U.S. And within the OSG, we were able to take part of an international consortium and uh, help researchers go from almost no computing time at all to over 30,000 cores per day on a variety of projects. So the take home message I like to emphasize is uh, you may be able to, uh, within a, a month or so, uh, buy a computer from Dell. You may, within a couple of minutes, be able to rent one from Amazon. But the sort of computing infrastructure that's necessary for research really takes experts, it takes developed software approaches in addition to these computers. And for when something like a pandemic arises, that the computer computing infrastructure might must always be in place already. You can't, within a day or two, rent a computer scientist. And I think that this research computing infrastructure and investment and expertise at Mortgage is something that really sets us apart and allows us to make impact uh, at Mortgage, across the UW-Madison campus, and across the nation. Thanks. Thank you so much, Brian. And next up is Dr. Ben Cox. He is a postdoctoral fellow working in the Morgridge Fab Lab, which is an extensive R&D space with capabilities in rapid prototyping and complex fabrication, led by Doc, direct, Director Kevin Elisari. He will share how engineering and prototyping tools can be used to aid healthcare workers during this pandemic. Hi, thanks for joining the webinar. My name is Ben Cox. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the Fab Lab, which is in the medical engineering theme at Mortgage. And I'll be talking briefly today about how engineering and rapid prototyping can aid in world health emergencies like COVID. Uh, but first I wanna introduce the Fab Lab a little. We are a fabrication facility located in the basement at Mortgage. Uh, we have everything from 3D printing to CNC machining to welding. Uh, we're a full service fabrication shop. Our lead investigator is Kevin Elisari. And I'm lucky enough to work with a really amazing staff. Uh, other full-time staff members include Brandon Walker, who's another postdoc, George Petrie, who's our lab manager, uh, Robert Swader, who's a mechanical engineer, and a whole host of students that are really talented and work on all of our projects in the lab. Uh, too many to picture here. The work we do in the lab is designing and fabricating early stage prototypes of new technology. So we work with campus inventors to realize uh, their ideas and then push them forward to patents and publications. We have two main application areas. Uh, the first is imaging hardware. So we have a lot of ties to imaging groups around campus. But the one that's more applicable to this discussion is medical devices. 
And our medical device work is really centered on a program we have in the lab called the Burby Walsh Prototype Pathway, where we connect clinician inventors uh, to engineering students and engineering staff uh, to help realize their ideas for devices that'll better their clinic clinical practice. Uh, so that's a little bit about who I am and who our group is. What I wanna talk about today is how uh, prototyping communities can aid in emergencies like COVID. Uh, but before I get into that, let's define what a prototyping community is. Uh, so prototyping communities include things like engineers and industrial manufacturers that you'd expect, uh, places like fabrication facilities like the Fab Lab. Uh, but I wanted to make the point that it also includes uh, makers in the community that have prototyping resources and knowledge and also community makerspaces. We're really lucky in Madison to have a couple of really great community makerspaces. So what I'm really talking about here is anyone who has resources for design and or fabrication. And the way that these people can help in health emergencies is by applying those resources um, to equipment shortages. And so with a lot of health emergencies, there are massive shortages of equipment. And with COVID-19, the big shortage has revolved around personal protective equipment or PPE. <clears throat> and so there's been a whole host of worldwide responses. Um, every city has, uh, a lot of cities have community responses. And in the interest of time, I really wanted to focus today on the Madison area response, but keep in mind that things like this are happening all over the country and world as well. Uh, so in Madison, the response really started because UW Health realized as they were watching COVID spread around the world that we could be um, looking at a potential shortage of PPE once we saw a huge uptick in numbers. And so they reached out through their contacts to the UW engineering community, and then it kind of grew to the community at large and it resulted in a Slack channel that gathered over 100 participants that included people from the university, uh, local organizations like Mortgage, community makerspaces, hospital supply chain people to kind of identify the need, and also our industry part partners in town to help manufacture some of these things. And I can't really talk about the local effort without mentioning Lennon Rogers. He's the director of the UW Makerspace, and he was really instrumental in kind of coalescing a lot of this effort and organizing workflows and things uh, to help organize this effort. And one of the projects he worked on uh, early on was the Badger Shield. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen the news coverage, but this was a really successful early project um, that Ford actually picked up. So Ford started making the design. And um, I think right now there are over, like there are thousands of these shields uh, in the field nat uh, nationwide. Um, but there are sub channels in this Slack group uh, that cover everything from trying to design more uh, available papper hoods that are more accessible, um, including the blower, battery, kind of every aspect of a papper hood. N95 masks, uh, UV sterilization, and more. And so that's kind of the Madison area prototyping response in general. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what the Fab Lab is doing in particular uh, to address some of the needs in PPE. And so we've recently started to address an issue that's not commonly thought of, and that's the comfort of PPE. And the reason we're looking at the comfort is because of things like this. And so because our healthcare workers are wearing protective equipment much longer than they were meant to wear them. Uh, we're seeing injuries to the face, to the nose, um, a lot of kind of injuries from prolonged wear uh, that we hadn't seen before. And the reason this is important is because when things aren't comfortable, it leads to people not wearing them correctly, uh, which impacts safety, obviously. Um, and so we're tackling this project with the help of a really talented graduate student in our group, Rebecca Alcock. And some of the things we're looking at are reducing pain in the ears from straps, um, increased adjustability so that we can change the way that these masks and equipment contact the skin, uh, looking at materials that are more comfortable on the skin, reducing fogging of glasses and eye protection, and many more. There's a lot of ways to address comfort. And so I know this was a really brief overview, but I wanted to leave you with a few key takeaways. The first is that prototyping communities can have an immense impact on health emergencies by creating medical devices during shortages. The second is that Personal protective equipment or PPE shortages have been felt throughout the world um, and the country during this COVID-19 outbreak, and they're continuing to be felt because we're not through this thing um, yet, obviously. Um, but you know, we should be proud in Madison because we have a very vibrant prototyping community uh, that responded really quickly to the coronavirus outbreak, um, and it's continuing to work towards uh, solutions for you know, alternative PPE for people. So with that, I wanna thank you for your attention and I'll welcome any questions during the general uh, question session. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ben. And finally, we are going to hear from Dr. Katherine Overmeyer. Katie is the Associate Director of the Laboratory for Biomolecular Mass Spectrometry 
at UW-Madison and a researcher in Dr. Josh Kuhn's lab. She applies cutting edge mass spectrometry techniques to biological questions. And she will share how the Kuhn Lab's recent collaboration with Albany Medical College yielded data that will be helpful in identifying risk factors for COVID-19 patients. Hello, uh, my name is Katie Overmeyer and I'm a member of Josh Kuhn's research group. And our focus is on developing technologies around mass spectrometry and enabling access to these technologies through collaborative science. One of the reasons um, mass spectrometers are so useful is that they can measure a diverse range of biomolecules. So you have DNA, which is the blueprints of the cell encoding for RNA. And then that RNA is used to transcribe proteins. And those proteins are the actors in many of these biological systems and pathways. And they um, use small molecule and interact with small molecules to both build up these macromolecules um, and also perform diverse functions. Mass spectrometry is one of the premier technologies for um, analyzing proteins, small molecules, and lipids. And one of the things that sets the Kuhn group apart is that we specialize not just in one of these, tech, one of these uh, class of molecules, proteins, or small molecules, but we try to capture all of them um, through various uh, platforms that we have in the lab. So we have a number of different instruments that are used to measure proteins and small molecules and lipids. And then we integrate these data together to get a more complete picture of the biological processes. What that means is that our group specializes, specializes a lot in technology development. Um, so we're modifying instruments and processes. Uh, and then we use those technologies in collaborations, which helps drive our science and, and the technology development. One of our recent collaborations um, was with Albany Medical College, uh, Dr. Ariel Jakovich, who's a pulmonary physician scientist. So we had worked with him um, to study chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. Then when COVID hit in April, um, Dr. Jakovich contacted Professor Kuhn and proposed a study um, to look at our COVID patients coming through his clinic. What Ariel noticed was that some patients did okay and some patients performed uh, really poorly um, and did not survive. And he was curious to understand what mechanisms might be underlying the severity of COVID response in patients. So he proposed that we measure molecules in plasma and blood. And we were really excited to do this because we're very good at measuring small molecules, lipids, and proteins. And Ariel proposed another data type, which would be white blood cells and, and RNA transcripts from white blood cells. Um, because white blood cells are really important to COVID response and the body's response to infection. To enable this technology to be incorporated with our mass spectrometry-based data, we teamed up with Ron Stewart, who's a Mortgage Institute for Research um, uh, uh, Associate Director of Bioinformatics. And him and his team helped uh, corral the RNA-seq data um, and helped us integrate it with the small molecule lipid and protein. Overall, the study design was a recruitment of patients with COVID-19 or patients that had symptoms similar to COVID-19 coming through the Albany Medical Center. In total, we recruited 102 COVID-19 patients and 26 non-COVID-19 patients. And they donated blood, which was separated for plasma and white blood cells. And in total, we measured thousands of molecules, um, small molecule metabolites, lipids, proteins, and RNA transcripts. But really at the heart of what we wanted to understand was what molecules were associated with the severity of COVID-19 response. To do this, we uh, integrated several different bioinformatic approaches, those molecules which were associated specifically with COVID-19 versus not, those molecules which were associated with severity, and then a machine learning approach to narrow in predictive molecules, those molecules which predicted severity. And in the heat map, uh, the, in the bottom left, those are all those patient samples and these 219 highly correlated molecules. 
what this summarizes down to is a really strong neutrophil degranulation response. Uh, many complement system proteins were also in this 219 features and high density lipoproteins. One example that I think is extremely cool from this data set and is enabled because we measured lots of different types of molecules is the association of HDL proteins and lipids with severity of COVID-19. And what we found was that uh, HDL APOA1 and 2, these are HDL particle associated proteins, were much lower in the most severe cases. And plasmologens, which is a type of lipid associated with HDL particles, also was significantly lower in COVID-19. And HDL particles are actually good cholesterol. So if you go in the clinic and you have cholesterol measurements, HDL is better to be high. Um, and lower HDL is actually associated with more severe response to infection. We believe that this is um, one of the ways in which uh, patients are less able to respond to COVID-19 coronavirus is because they have fewer HDL particles in this anti-inflammatory response. Another protein which we saw associated with this molecule is this SAA2 protein, and it can replace APOA1 in these HDL particles and make it less um, antioxidant capabilities and is more pro-inflammatory. Again, is associated with worse severity for COVID-19 patients. We have many, many examples, um, and that was those data are featured in a med archive post you can find now online. Uh, the link is here. We also created with these data a huge interactive web tool called COVID Omicstat app. And you can go and you can find any molecule that we measured and look at how it correlates with different clinical outcomes. Um, so severity of COVID, whether it associates with ICU or not. Um, we encourage you and uh, your friends to go check that out and to be scientists and, and help us figure out why COVID is um, and, and its associations with severity. I also wanna thank Mortgage Institute for Research, um, the Albany Medical College and their team for their help, um, Ron Stewart and his, his team with their support with the RNA-seq data uh, and numerous Kunlan members, uh, especially Evgenia Sipskova who helped all the way through um, from day one and Ian Miller who helped develop the web tool. Uh, all right, thank you so much, Katie. And so now let's bring all the scientists back on to answer some questions generated by the audience. Hello, everyone. All right, so I'm gonna start with, um, with John, uh, going back to the very first talk and ask the obvious questions, which is why llamas? <laughs> um, because they're so cute. Uh, <laughs> but uh, but there is a there is another better better reason, and we'll see um, if I can demonstrate it here using some uh, twist ties. So uh, a typical antibodies binding site. If you were to take the antibody from a person or a mouse or a rabbit, the and I'm going to represent this antibody with these twist ties. The binding site of the antibody, the end here, is actually made up of two different protein chains um, that are sort of twisted around and wrapped around one another. And so to make an antibody that's a standard antibody like this, we need to make both of those protein chains and get them to associate together in the right way. But with a llama antibody, um, llamas and their relatives, so this also goes for alpacas and, and camels, make a particular kind of antibody where it's just the antibody binding site is just made from a single chain. So to make antibodies like this, all we have to do is produce that one chain and it makes them much, much easier to produce in the lab. Um, just again, like by growing up single cells, we can get the single cells to make the proteins and there's, there's really no additional work that's required on top of that. So this is sort of a special, a special skill or an immune trick that, um, that llamas, alpacas, camels and, and their relatives all have. It's a great question. <laughs> But llamas are really cute too. All right, that's that's fascinating. <laughs> Love a llama. All right, so next question is for for Tony. Uh, this is from the chat. So, how does Manubot handle and rank contradictory articles in Lancet on things like hydroxychloroquine? 
uh, where they had to retract articles? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. And uh, the controversy over hydroxychloroquine specifically was one of the reasons that Casey and Haley decided to launch this review project because there was uh, so much contradictory evidence and misinformation floating around. So Manubot itself is, is mostly a writing tool to make the writing process easier for large teams. It doesn't have to make any automated decisions about how to prioritize or weigh different types of contradictory evidence or, or different uh, studies saying contradictory things. So what happens in practice is that uh, the team of authors will, will keep up with the literature and when we notice these retractions or we notice new studies about some of the hot treatments and vaccines that are being discussed, we as a team will rapidly update that section of the text. So for hydroxychloroquine in particular, we have uh, a section dedicated to controversy that describes some of the early studies and reasons why some scientists were interested in it, and then some of the studies and flaws of those studies where our team said that these clinical trials actually have some holes in them. We, we uh, caution against overinterpreting these results. And then when there's a retraction like the Lancet study, we will explicitly note this study has been retracted because of these limitations that were detected. All right. So next question is going to go to Brian from our third lecture. And can you comment on how biomedical researchers recognize that they need help with research computing and need help from research computing scientists uh, in order to pursue their projects? Yeah, to some extent, uh, when, when there's pain, they, they hopefully go look for people who have medicine. Um, you know, to some extent, scientists are social animals too, and and uh, they, you know, as uh, we can realize and work with our peers and, and look toward each other to to understand that there is something where they're waiting on computing, uh, where they have the ability to think bigger. You know, th this is the the value you get from having uh, nearby computer scientists or, or people who are interested in, in infrastructure who want to sit down and, and work with the, the researchers. So uh, kind of at the, the mortgage scale or the campus scale, there's reaching out, there's uh, building up collaborations, there, there is, you know, again, sitting down and understanding with scientists. Uh, for the national scale, it's a little bit different. Uh, one of the things that we participate in is the HPC Consortium uh, that helps, uh, it was, put together specifically for COVID-19 research and serves as a bit of a matchmaker to, to help uh, people who know and understand that they have tasks or, or need this uh, to get national scale resources, uh, whether it's from the projects we work with, whether it's from the big supercomputing centers around the US or even in case, some cases, uh, Amazon or Microsoft. All right, fantastic. Next up uh, is a question to Ben about PPE. And there were a couple questions in the chat about other types of projects that would protect against COVID. So uh, for example, uh, supplies to use for protecting people in classrooms or specialized situations like choirs. Um, so I hope you could comment on that and then maybe also expand and talk about how, what is the process for developing medical devices? Uh, you know, How do you go about making those decisions and um, what does that look like? Sure, no, that, that's a great question. Um, so I'll start with the design process. And so at least from our point of view in our lab, all of our design projects always start with a need. And so we always have a clinician or somebody that identifies some sort of need or shortcoming in the clinic that they think could be addressed with some sort of novel device. And then they come to us and if it's something we think we can address, we then work with them to define uh, design constraints and get at really the core of what mechanically they're trying to accomplish. Um, and then we uh, work with them and with engineering students to come up with an initial prototype. And that's never the final prototype. We always uh, have design reviews with our staff and it's amazing how much designs evolve through the course of this process. And then uh, we iterate based on all the feedback uh, that we get during those design reviews and hopefully approach something that's workable for the clinician. Um, kind of towards some of the specialized questions, uh, I think Kevin added something to the chat, uh, but there, there is some effort from the Badger Shield project at least to make shields that are designed for teachers. Um, beyond that, I'm not exactly sure, uh, you know, what's going on in terms of helping out with uh, better remote learning for classrooms. Um, Cause we've really been focused, especially in Madison on potential shortages and making kind of replacements for things that could be in short supply. Um, and then singing, I'm not really sure what that would look like. It's a great question because I think um, singing has been one of those activities that 
is actually one of the higher risk activities now because as you sing, you're projecting your voice really loudly. There's a lot of droplets where you can transmit the virus. Um, so that's a great question. I'm not actually sure what that might look like. Um, so hopefully that answers. Mm -hmm. And as a follow-up, what can you give us an example of one of the medical devices uh, that you've developed in the Fab Lab? Sure, yeah. Uh, so we have uh, clinician collaborators from all sorts of fields. Um, things ranging from, we worked with a burn doctor, uh, Dr. Angela Gibson, to develop a device to recreate in the lab uh, burns uh, that they could study to then develop treatments. Uh, it's really actually hard to create uh, kind of sustainable and consistent burns um, in a lab setting. So on that end, and then there's all sorts of smaller devices we make. We work with ER doctors all the time. We've done some endoscope uh, type projects. Um, just off the top of my head, those are a couple that I can think of. And next up, I'm gonna have a couple of questions for Katie. Uh, first up, uh, I know you answered this in the chat as well, but I was hoping you could, you could speak to it. So what percentage of the blood samples are from older populations? And can you speak to the demographics of, of the blood samples? Yeah, so I, I, I tried to corral some of that data, um, but I also invite you all to look at that as well. It's a, fairly easy to access through the web tool. Um, the average age was around 60, so older population, as you might expect. Um, there were some younger patients as well. Um, and then that age range was very similar for people that had COVID-19 versus our control group without COVID-19. Um, was about 60, 60 to 65 age range. And can you speak about what other molecules you identified that are associated with lower severity in SARS-CoV-2, or, or I guess by, by opposite, even higher severity? Um, so lower severity being, so there's two directions, right? Things which increase with severity and things which decrease with severity. So the decreasing things are HDL, um, particle-associated proteins and lipids. Things which were increasing with severity were things like neutrophil, um, and that's one of the hypotheses that's been put out there as a neutrophil degranulation um, occurring with uh, in COVID patients, um, and that that has some negative consequences, leads to thrombotic events, um, so this hypercoagulation state. Um, in the coagulation pathway, we also see um, both up and down proteins. So we think that that's also being um, changed in COVID patients in their blood. Um, and uh, I think the other ones we, we see changing. Um, uh, there, there was some folic acid metabolites that are related um, proteins that were changing as being down also in COVID patients. Um, so uh, yeah, I, I think uh, a lot of this has been summarized in the manuscript, um, but we also, we don't highlight everything because there are many, many, many molecules, um, thousands that are changing with COVID. Um, I think our, our number of things which were up or down in COVID patients was around 2000. And it's only when you look at severity and when you apply machine learning where we're able to narrow it down to 200. Um, yeah, really do check out the tool. It's super cool. Uh, we really want it to be used. Uh, we want you guys to ask your own questions if there's proteins or molecules you're curious about. All right. So. Yeah, everyone check it out. I, I believe the, the link was just posted again in the chat mm -hmm. for anyone that wants yeah. to check it out. And then I want to kind of throw out a question to the whole group as a whole. Uh, so in general, mortgage scientists focus on basic science questions and a long view of science. And that's very different than working on emerging emerging virus like SARS-CoV-2. So I was curious if you could comment on how did you make the decision to shift your research uh, from what you typically work on to what this problem was? And was that a difficult decision? Anyone can jump in. I can go first if you want. <laughs> Um, we already do a lot of device development, and so it seemed like a no-brainer to kind of jump in, especially once we kind of heard about this local effort and we had the resources available. And so I think early on, um, we a few of our lab members jumped on the Slack channel and just helped with design, um, to, to design help for some of the sub-channels, um, and also just a lot of research help. And so I think one of the channels we were involved with was the N95 channel, which is a really tricky problem, um, creating something that's equivalent to, you know, this FDA-regulated uh, very kind of actually sophisticated 
piece of, of um, equipment, this mask that, that filters down to you know, 0.3 microns. And, um, and so we helped out with design there and we were connecting people. And then uh, we realized that you know, we could tailor some of our projects to um, actually developing some of these devices. And that's the new angle now with Comfort. We were trying to find kind of a niche that wasn't, um, wasn't really addressed in the channel yet that we felt like we could make an impact. And so that's kind of why we decided to go that route. But we were already, we have a lot of students. Uh, we take on device design projects all the time. And so it seemed kind of like an no-brainer to jump in in that regard for us. All right. From from the research computing side, you know, to to some extent, uh, switching uh, switching gears is what we do professionally. Uh, the Center for High Throughput Computing, for example, supports about three hundred different groups on campus and delivers about uh, about a four hundred million CPU hours per year. So we get really good at helping identify scientists that can need help, that prioritize and and be able to, to shift resources their way. So uh, obviously when a big uh, societal impact important project like uh, COVID-19 comes up, uh, this is uh, at least to us somewhat natural. I guess I can also chime in a little bit. So we're in, in the Newmark lab, I mentioned in my, in my presentation that we're primarily a developmental biology lab and we study flatworms. But when you're talking about viruses, because viruses need to get inside cells to do their dirty work, um, almost any, any research that has to do with cells and how they behave has some kind of connection to virology. Like virology ends up, ends up weaving together a whole bunch of different biological subdisciplines. And so it wasn't a huge stretch for us to, to just shift some of what we were doing uh, towards developing tools to address the, the COVID problem. The, the big decision, I guess, that needed to be made was just, do we have, do we have money and people's time to put into the project? Uh, that was mostly um, up to Phil, who, who calls those shots, and, uh, and he's, he's been very supportive from, from the beginning. Um, so it, it hasn't been that much of a, uh, of a, of a shift for us. I sometimes joke that, um, you know, in, in looking for nanobodies or antibodies that will help out with, with the COVID epidemic, um, I'm getting the practice that's going to make me better at generating antibodies for worm research down the road. Um, so so uh, it, it's, uh, it's not that far off topic for us. All right. And how has the research changed in just in the context of the risk of the virus has thing have things been different for you uh, in the lab? Are you, are you asking? Are I'm you asking, asking anybody. Or, or yeah, anyone? anyone can yeah, jump, can jump in. in. <laughs> it, it's you hear a lot more crickets chirping uh, these days. So we're as as much as possible. We're all working from home unless unless there are things that you absolutely have to go into the lab to do. Um, so the lab is is definitely a bit more empty than than it has been. That that's the main thing that. Um, I'd notice lunch lunch breaks are not as social as they uh, as they used to be for sure. I know for our team we had to um, do special updates to our our biosafety protocol and and make announcements outside the door like don't enter the lab because we have active COVID nineteen samples being processed. Um, but a lot of the same procedures we deal with with many of these human derived samples is that most things are infectious. It's called universal precautions. So something from us as, as people handling samples um, is that they probably are infected with something. Um, so many of the same processes we would do for any blood sample, we also applied for these. Yeah. For, for a uh, computing guy like me, it's easy to think, gee, you know, he, he just goes home and he needs Wi-Fi. what else? Uh, and uh, so, so maybe the, the lab aspects haven't changed at all, but the in terms of the collaborative and, and social aspects, you know, it's it's always amazing to see how much more overhead it ta takes to have a five minute conversation with somebody uh, when you have to organize things over over Zoom as opposed to being able to walk down the office. So you really feel, and you have to, to really put in extra effort to make sure you reach out and. Uh, uh, work with your collaborators and, and make sure you communicate well with them, even even if you're not at the lab. Mm -hmm. 
And can someone, I, I, we had a quick question here just as to wrap up. I mean, how, how does this COVID pivoted research get funded? How do you, you know, typically people work on, on long-term grants. Um, can anyone speak to that? So I can speak to that a bit. I think uh, part of the, the interesting features of the Mortgage Institute is that many of our labs, and I can speak for myself as somebody who runs one of the computational labs here, have this flexibility to decide what to go after next, whether that's the next long-term project or pivoting to something in the very short term. So uh, for me, at least, I, I have this flexibility using support from the Rose Center or support from the Mortgage Institute to go off and explore something when an opportunity arises. And oftentimes, if it is a big, uh, that spirals into a longer project or if it requires a lot of experimental resources or a lot of personnel, we do seek external funding. We need other support to continue that work for months or years, but it, it really is special being at the Mortgage Institute so that we can pivot as the needs arise. All right. All right, thank you. Thank you all so much for coming out today and giving us a little update about your research. Uh, that's all we have time for, but I will leave the, the session open for a little bit in case you wanna scroll back and check out any of the questions. And for the scientists, feel free to answer any other ones that came up uh, or share the links again. And uh, just so you know, we, we offered a free sticker if anyone would like that. And uh, we can also put up a link to sign up for Mortgage's e-newsletter if you'd like to continue receiving that. Uh, thank you all for joining us and Make sure to wear a mask, wash your hands, and take care. <laughs> Thank you.